Aloha. We are back uh, in our series about uh, foundations of nursing. And today we're going to talk a little bit about isolation. Uh, isolation is separation and restriction of movement of patients with a contagious disease. And there are different types of isolation in the clinical setting. And we're going to talk about some of those today. There is airborne isolation, droplet uh, precautions, and contact um, precautions or isolation. And um, these types of isolation are really tied to uh, their mode of transmission, okay? Um, so for example, if we have an airborne uh, mode of transition, we know that these types of infections um, are so tiny, the, dro the droplets are so tiny that when the patient coughs or sneezes, the infectious material is actually suspended in the air uh, for a certain period of time where another individual can then breathe in uh, that, that infection. And so that's um, an airborne uh, type of uh, transmission. Um, droplet uh, is a little bit different in that uh, the droplet precaution or isolation um, is still uh, some type of spraying, right, of, of an infectious um, agent. But in this case, uh, the droplets are a little bit larger, right? And so the actual infectious material isn't as suspended in the air. It doesn't linger in the air. Usually it can't really travel um, more than a few feet and then it kind of drops. And so that is a droplet precaution. Um, and then there's contact, right? And in this case, um, the way that you would be transmitting is to have direct contact um, with the um, uh, infectious material, right? Either through a wound that has an infection in it um, or um, some other um, mode of contact that could cause the exchange of the bacteria. And uh, we talked a little bit about um, using protective equipment, personal protective equipment to protect ourselves um, in the clinical setting um, from being infected with uh, these materials. And so uh, we might have a patient that's on airborne uh, precautions um, and we would be required to wear eye protection. Um, so this would be splash goggles, a face shield, a procedure mask with a visor, um, a mask, a surgical mask, or even an N95 mask, which we'll talk a little bit about a gown, uh, a yellow isolation gown that's tied in the back, um, and gloves. And these would be probably clean gloves, um, not sterile gloves, um, for, um, for any type of, of interaction with that patient. Um, so for airborne transmission, we said that uh, it occurs by the spread of airborne droplet nuclei. And these are less than five micrometers in size. It's not so important that you memorize that or know that specifically. Um, but what this means is, is that these types of infections um, are evaporated droplets that remain suspended in the air for a long period of time. Um, and dust particles um, containing the infectious agent, okay? So the airborne precautions are designed to reduce the risk of airborne transmission. And the patient is usually placed in a special room with negative airflow. And this means that the air is filtered and exhausted directly to an outside source. Um, so that would be ventilated like up onto the roof of the hospital um, where uh, the air that's being pumped in and out of the room is, is coming up and out through um, the roof of the hospital. And um, uh, there may be the use of an N95 mask. Uh, many of you may already be fitted or will be fitted for an N95 mask. Um, here you see um, an image of one nurse 
um, uh, fitting another nurse with an N95 where we kind of use a hood and we fit the N95 mask on and then we will spray like a sweet tasting spray inside the hood. And if you can taste that spray, we know that the N95 is not correctly um, fitted onto your face. And so once we get it fitted on properly, we'll have you move in lots of different positions while we're spraying this uh, sweet uh, tasting spray um, to identify that in several positions, when you're talking, when you're not talking, when you're doing different activities that the mask is not moving around and exposing you so that you can um, then taste the sweet uh, spray. It, uh, some of the airborne agents that we know about um, are SARS, tuberculosis, influenza, measles, um, and pertussis. Um, and so uh, droplet transmission, we said, involves contact of the uh, conjunctiva. That would be our eyes or mucous membranes of our nose or mouth of a susceptible person with a large particle droplet. And so these uh, are larger than five micrometers in size. Um, the droplets are generally from the source person, primarily during coughing, sneezing, or talking, um, and during the, the performance of certain procedures, um, such as suctioning and bronchoscopy. Uh, remember we said a little bit ago that droplets don't really remain suspended in the air, and they generally travel only a short distance, usually three feet or less. Um, and it really does require closer contact between the source and the recipient person. Um, so especially, especially ventilated rooms and air handling and ventilation aren't uh, required for this type of infection. Um, and so droplet precautions will be wearing a face mask, such as a procedure or surgical mask for close contact with the patients. Uh, the face mask should be donned upon the room. If substantial spraying of respiratory fluids is anticipated, a glove and gown as well as goggles or face shield will be uh, worn um, in, that, in that case. Um, and so uh, in contact precautions, uh, we're gonna be wearing gloves when touching a patient and the patient's immediate environment or belongings. Um, and we'll also wear a gown if substantial contact with the patient or their environment is anticipated, okay? Um, so it's important, I think, to differentiate uh, what we mean by standard precautions, okay? So in many cases, the risk of a nosocomial transmission of infection can be the highest before we even know that the patient has the infection, right? We said before, you know, if we have a patient who's having like multiple bouts of diarrhea throughout the day, we might, before we even send their stool sample down to the lab to see if they have C. diff, we might say, you know, we're gonna put this patient on isolation because we are anticipating that they may have it, okay? Same thing in the suspected case of tuberculosis. If we think that a patient might, might have TB, we will probably put them on isolation before we get the official diagnosis um, because it takes time, right, for lab results to come back. And what we don't want to do is be spreading infection during the time that we're waiting to get the definitive diagnosis. So um, the routine use of standard precautions for all patients, right, should greatly reduce the risk for conditions um, you know, other than those that we know require airborne droplet or contact precautions. So what are standard precautions? Um, if we know that we're gonna have a risk for contact with any blood or body fluids um, or non-intact skin and mucous membrane, we wanna use really good hand washing, we wanna use um, PPE, and we wanna use uh, good cough etiquette, right? Uh, meaning that we would um, kind of cough kind of over to the side into our elbow. Okay, so that is kind of the end 
of um, our talk today about the different types of contact um, precautions that we can, we can have with a patient. Uh, if you recall, we discussed airborne precautions, we discussed um, droplet precautions, and we discussed contact precautions. And then we also discussed the basic standard precautions that we would use in any situation where we might be um, at risk for um, being in contact with bodily secretions. Uh, I hope this was helpful for you today. Um, I want to encourage you to review this information also in your textbook as well, and feel free to ask any questions as they come up. Thanks and have a great day.